Good job. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, and welcome to ECJS Carbon Auditorium. Those of you from the public, thank you for coming. To you to college, welcome. Students, thank you. And this afternoon is something a little different. I want to say hello to all our friends on the internet since we're streaming this live, and we have many of our youth college students who are enrolled in our master's program. And Perhaps they're watching this live throughout the country. Uh, I think that's going on, so we say hello to them. And thank you to everyone for who ever contributed to the success of today's event. This is great, and thanks especially on behalf of Dean Nori, James Nori, who is the dean of our school, uh, and on behalf of him, thanks to the faculty who are here not only in support and the students in support of today, but the faculty who sit on our our panel, uh, this whole program, and all the things we do here in this building wouldn't be possible without the support of our faculty and the support of our students. So this is great to have an affair like this. For those of you who may not know it, we offer three different criminal justice degrees here at Utah College, three undergraduate degrees. One is in traditional criminal justice. The other is in economic crime investigation or fraud, white collar crime. And the third is in cybersecurity. In addition to that, we offer two master's degrees, one in economic crime management, and the other is in cybersecurity. And then last, we also have created, and, and thanks to the hard work of Professor Lynch, has grown geometrically the financial crime investigation certificate. We continue to stay on the cutting edge of things in this arena, thanks to the hard work of a lot of our faculty, today especially to Professor Gibbons, who will introduce the panel, but he's the one who put this on today, and he created it, we'd like to thank him. So, looking forward to a successful panel discussion. Professor Austin Gibbons. At a conference this past Tuesday, Google CEO Eric Schmidt said, quote, we're going to wind up breaking the internet, close quote. At this same conference, Microsoft's top lawyer, Brad Smith, said, quote, just as people won't put money in a bank they won't trust, people won't use an internet they won't trust, close quote. Colin Stretch, an attorney for Facebook, who spoke at the same conference, 
added that efforts to encrypt user data are now, quote, a key business objective for all of us, close quote. What these Google, Microsoft, and Facebook executives were describing is an enormous erosion of trust in internet security today. U.S. government surveillance efforts, they claim, are putting a chill on the openness that sparks amazing innovations online and has led directly to the United States being a global leader in developing new technologies. And all of these concerns are a direct outgrowth of one man, Edward Snowden. In June 2013, when Edward Snowden disclosed the existence of a massive national security agency spy program, U.S. citizens, not to mention our allies overseas, were outraged. Here at home, Silicon Valley responded by protesting against the NSA surveillance efforts. Our allies overseas were upset too. Angela Merkel, the current chancellor of Germany, has noted that her country is now trying to figure out how to route emails through European data servers so that they don't go near servers in the United States where they might be spied on. And yet, despite the controversy that Edward Snowden's disclosure produced, cyber threats to US security and international security persist. During the past two months, over 100 Hollywood celebrities' private photos, many of them compromising, were posted online after hackers were able to break into these celebrities' iCloud accounts. More recently, Home Depot revealed that hackers had stolen information about nearly 56 million credit card numbers. And within the past week, J.P. Morgan Chase, a banking giant, disclosed that it had suffered what is now being called the largest hack in history. 83 million customer accounts and passwords were compromised. The post-Edward Snowden era invites us to reflect, I think, on a fundamental question about data privacy. What is the proper balance between liberty and security today? How much privacy are we willing to give up in order to be safe? Or, put another way, how safe do we want to be? And what will that require of us in terms of reducing privacy? And are these things mutually exclusive? Is it the case that we must sacrifice this for that? Today's panel strives to address these and similar questions from multiple angles and perspectives. Chandler Gibbon, our first speaker, is an attorney with Ellison PC, a law firm in Chicago, and specializes in investigations of complex technology fraud. Leslie Corbo, our second speaker, is a senior analyst with Fishney and teaches cybersecurity courses here in New York. Sue Lynch, our third speaker, is a professor of practice in economic crime and former vice president for security and risk management at MasterCard Worldwide. Ray Filo, our final speaker for the day, is a professor of practice in criminal justice here, as well as executive director of the Economic Crime and Cybersecurity Institute, and came to UC after a long and distinguished career in law enforcement, retiring as chief of police in New Hartford, New York. Full speaker bios are available in today's program. The rest of today's panel will proceed as follows. Each speaker will present for 10 minutes. Now, speakers, we're keeping a very close eye on you. So you'll be given a heads up for two minutes, one minute, and then you'll be promptly cut off. No, seriously. Do I look like I'm joking? Yeah. <laughs> After our speakers have presented, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. And for our online viewers, Please send in your questions to this email address, adgibbons at utica.edu, and please be sure to include where you're writing from. We'll try to get as many of your questions as we can. After we're done here today, 
You're all welcome to hang out in the atrium where there's cookies and coffee. First up today is Chandler Gibbons. Chandler. Thanks, Austin. I think probably the nicest words I've ever said about me before. <laughs> So now let's talk about digital fingerprinting. Um, 
We can generally define digital fingerprinting as technology used to identify an individual using unique data associated with the software or hardware that they use, right? This is like, it's a mouthful, but let me try to explain how it works. So, everyone here browses the web, probably using one of these web browsers, right? On the screen, it's Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, et cetera. Each one of these web browsers is also special in its own way, and it's special because every different web browser, the computer that the web browser sits on, has a unique configuration. What you see on the screen here is a website that was developed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and it allows you to have a test run on your browser to show how unique your web browser is. Here's the results of the test that I ran in my own web browser. And I'll blow this up for you. You can see this is some of the information that's available to a website as you browse. Um, what you see here is information about all the different web browsers on the computer, which is kind of interesting at first glance because I only usually use Chrome, right? But it explains to the website that I'm visiting that I have Firefox downloaded, I have Chrome, I have Safari, and it provides different versions. You also see parenthetically there uh, a little bit of information about my operating system and the processor that I use, right? So this might not seem significant, right, when you first look at it, but over time, you start to develop more and more unique configurations in your web browser. So for example, here is all the plugin information about my web browser, right? And so what websites are able to do is this. They use analytics companies and they'll associate the web browser identifiers that are shown here on the screen with who you are. So you log into a website once and they say, okay, Chandler Gibbons, his web browser configuration is this. Then in the future, they don't need you to log in to know what you're doing. All they have to see is the unique fingerprint associated with the web browser. So as soon as you hit their website, they know who it is, right? And the companies that are doing this, you probably haven't heard of, maybe a couple like Experian, for example, but Axiom, Rapidly, Fango, Quantas, these are analytics companies and data brokers that are the ones who are responsible for doing this type of digital fingerprint. They also offer it on your smartphones, and I'm running out of time, I think, but um, they also operate on your smartphone. So every time you use an app or you browse the web, you also transmit a tremendous amount of information about the hardware associated with your device. Um, so some of the identifiers I have on the screen here, INSI, uh, IMEI, the UDID, and MAC address, these are all identifiers associated with the hardware of your phone. And a lot of these are transmitted to some of these same data analytics companies. And what they can do is they can associate this data with the information that I just told you about from the web browser. And now they have a holistic view pretty much everything you're doing online, whether it's your smartphone, whether it's your computer, and they connect all this information up into a profile about you on the back. So, what does this all mean? Well, I don't really know for sure, but here's what I expected. I think that in the near future, what's going to happen is the government's going to start subpoenaing records from these data analytics companies and data brokers. Uh, what you see on the screen here is materials that were disclosed by Edward Snowden um, during some of the recent leaks, don't worry, I got this from New York Times, so I don't think the feds are going to knock that majority of them soon, which they need to want to do, as you all know now. Um, but you can see here in the highlighted section that the NSA is looking into certain unique identifiers associated with folks' uh, smartphones, right? So what they can do is, instead of going to Facebook and asking for all the records about an individual, they can go to one of the data brokers and say, give us all the information you have about the person associated with these IDs. And they have a huge profile, and they give all sorts of information to the government. <coughs> and so here's a recent FTC report where they describe some of the types of information that are being held by these data brokers. Um, things like your name, your address, um, let's see, race, religion, whether or not you're a single parent, social media sites you visit, whether you're on a pet, whether you gamble, the text you're supposed to do, your favorite celebrities, the type of car you drive, how much money you make, your political affiliation. Preferred vacation destination, book screen, whether you smoke, how often you're alive, book screen, fire system, types of drugs you buy, etc. Um, so the point is that, well, I'm out of time now, but here's what I'll leave you with. Um, this all sounds very scary, I know, right? Because there's folks out there who have all this information. Um, if you care about this, what you should do is tell your friends what you learned here today. Um, because awareness is a huge part of understanding what's going on. And the second thing I'll say is if you really care, Talk to your congressman. There's, there's a need for legislation right now to regulate this type of behavior. The third thing I'll say is if you really, really care, you should become a lawyer. Like, fight for the rights of, you know, folks <laughs> or the privacy rights violence. Or last, what you could do is write software to write this type of thing. And make a billion dollars and donate all the back to the Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
let me finish. I'm Leslie Corpo. I'm an adjunct lecturer here at Houston College, and I work with the cybersecurity analyst, um, an information system security manager, and officer, and now I'm working um, as a senior client engagement manager for a company called Fishing. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today a little more about the way we use um, some of our social media, the, the kind of profile that people can build. Um, about us. So what I named my presentation, and I've been working on an article by this name for about a year and a half now, so I'm so glad I could bring it here to all of you. Um, I named it from the information age to the age of oversharing, because what we do um, in our social media, um, we're using um, Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, LinkedIn, and what we're allowing, what we're doing is, I think we're, we're tending to overshare because my opinion is this, I think that we kind of like the notoriety that we get from having an online presence. Um, I think that having these kinds of things about us online kind of make us feel important, they make us feel special. Um, it's a great way to stay in touch with friends and family members and things like that, but it's also something that um, we're, we're telling people a lot of information about us, which is okay, um, but the problem is with these, with these social media outlets, the privacy rules change all the time. They're, they're constantly changing. There's so many updates that are done on a regular basis. Um, just Facebook alone, I think, has well over 200 updates that they're, that they're doing to their software on a regular basis. And how many of you think that they're really thinking about our privacy and security when they're making those updates? Because nobody raised their hand because you know they're not. Um, so we're giving away a lot of information about it. So some of the things that we're giving away, we're giving away um, information about our families. Um, it amazes me how many people put their children's names, ages, dates of birth, things like that on their, on their Facebook page. Um, we're giving away where, we, where we're going on vacation. And there's been documented instances where um, people who've gone on vacation have come home to an empty house because you know, you, you're telling everyone you're on vacation. If, if you think you can trust everybody to, to keep that information and say, oh, that's nice, you know, you have to think kind of like a bad guy. And in some instances, you, um, you're coming home from vacation to a house that doesn't have anything. Um, you complain about your bank. You complain about your bank on, on Twitter or, or Facebook. Um, <coughs> Any kind of thing like that, somebody is, is able to, you know, grab that information about you. And something that um, I think the Washington Times just mentioned the other day was that um, ISIS, the terrorist organization, is now using um, information that they're finding on social media to target family of military and military members right here in the United States. So these kinds of things, when you're when you're putting all this information about yourself out there um, on social media, it, it can it can be quite scary. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Even my nature should have a place in our collection for things of a seemingly trivial nature when enjoyed with others of a more serious cast may lead to a valuable conclusion. And what George Washington meant when he said that was, I can take this piece of information about you and this piece of information about you, which probably means nothing, but when I start putting it all together, I'm building a really, really good profile about you. And that's what, that's what other countries are doing to us. That's what um, we're all, you know, other people who want to harm us 
are doing this. So this is something that um, you know you really need to think about when you're putting your information out there. What are people doing? How are they using it against us? And so what I like to call um, my strategy, and, and I hope you employ this, is we call it defense in depth. And defense in depth is not going to make it so that nothing ever happens to you. Um, you're going to you're going to have you're going to have um, instances where your where your hacked or your your compromised or your information is taken. It's it could it could happen. But what you want to do is is do everything that you can in your power to where that doesn't happen. So securing, um, hardening your social media presence, which isn't an easy thing to do because guess what? Um, every time you change the way you're doing things, the, the um, Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn is changing their security policies as well. So there's, there's a lot of different things that you need to um, keep. And you can't just do it once and forget about it. There's no such thing as fix and forget when you're talking about your security and your online presence. Um, using more complex passwords. You know, one of the things that you, you think about is your, your um, how you're how you're doing your password. And don't use the same password for every single um, website that you visit. And I know it's easy to do, but you doing that can put you at at risk. Um, keeping your your system updated, and your firewall on, and your antivirus up. Um, the last one, really important, um, opening up emails or clicking on links or attachments, um, accepting friend requests from people that you don't know. Those kinds of things are, um, those are the things that will get you. And, and um, if, if I leave you with anything at all, it's, it's the, the adage, just don't click. If you don't know where it came from, don't, don't click on it. Um, it's really not that important anyways. Okay? Um, and that is that is all for me. So thank you. <laughs>
your credit card data, as I stated, $0.25 cents to $60. $60 is for the platinum, the black card, that are still alive. Because you don't know yet if your card's been compromised. Now, if you're using a black card at Dairy Queen, this may be a $60 sell on the internet. When we talk about Facebook, as Leslie was just referring to, a dollar for an account with 15 friends. So what are they doing? They're gathering intelligence. So you can buy whatever you want, you've heard that before, but when we start looking at our financial data and what's available, one, we can say that credit cards are literally a dime a dozen, especially those cards that have been tested. We look at our personal information, for instance, uh, Chase Bank that Austin referred to, and they Chase still insists, you know, that it was just their account number, or I should say, your name and address and that kind of information, which is great. But this brings to mind the fact that how much data is stored on you and the security. Uh, you know, we've talked about is there legislation, is there government legislation? How does one notify? How do you know if your data has been breached? What are organizations doing about it? This is a picture, and kids, there won't be a test, all right? But this is a very high level description of systems your card goes through the minute you swipe it. And this is just a smaller version. Your data goes, when you say, oh, it's going from point A to point B, it could be going through multiple servers all with risk at each endpoint. So if you've got guys that are spending all day long trying to hack into a network, they all they have to go is to the weakest point. And you have many, many types of companies out there that store your data and that process your data. And as we look at the card as well as any electronic transaction, there are numerous weak points, unfortunately. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, because data breaches are in the news in many, many forms, and at least one in many. So how do we determine there's a data breach? What do we do? How do we analyze? People say, well, why did it take them six months to figure out where the card was breached? Very difficult. There are billions of credit card transactions processed every day. So what we have to do is look for the fraud first. So when you call in and say, my card, you know, someone just uh, spent $500 at a 7-Eleven, um, which you would call unusual behavior, maybe, you report your cards as fraud. So what banks and MasterCard, Visa, American Express have to do is Look at all that data and do a lot of significant detailed analysis. So these billions of transactions we get, or MasterCard gets, because you have to report your fraud. But there's also time lags. So what happens is you take these billions of transactions, and what is the end goal? If everyone's reporting fraud on their card, what we need to look at where was your last valid transaction? Where was your last good transaction? And there are multiple. How many people use their card number of days, whether it's credit card or debit card? It's very difficult to do that analysis. So when someone comes to you and says, well, why did it take so long to identify? To find the point of compromise. That is when we understand where the bad guys got into the network. This is a very high level picture of link analysis, uh, but you could probably expand this thousands of cards, thousands of processors, thousands of businesses. How do you how are you able to link where the good transaction is? So we're not we're not looking at fraud, we're looking at the fraud, yes, but we're trying to look at where was your last good transaction? And that's why it takes a lot of analysis. There's a lot of players 
in your card transaction. Merchants store your data. However, do they store it correctly? We look at wireless. You can swipe your card at an outside gas terminal. Right? That's a wireless transaction at the pump. That goes off into um, cyberspace. Is it encrypted? Maybe, maybe not. So there's so many different paths that that transaction information goes through that that becomes a forensic audit of systems. It also becomes the manual and human analysis of where did the data go. And that's why we, frankly, we make it easy for bad guys. We also see this increase due to a lot of geopolitical issues in regions. What's the best way? Go after your financial information, right? So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. Wow. What a time to be having this forum and this discussion. We are bombarded literally every minute of every day by different news media outlets about the issues of national security or law enforcement and the balance of data privacy and data security. Um, just this morning, another article on, on data security and how it's affecting law enforcement's ability to collect what they perceive to be essential data. So it's really a relevant time to be having uh, this discussion. The modern, what I would call the modern era of data privacy and the issues associated with data security, data privacy by quote unquote an intrusive government actually goes back to like many aspects of, of our modern lives to the 9 11 attacks. It's interesting from a historical perspective. Um, if you look at the history of the United States, anytime the United States has found itself in a crisis, usually a war, whether it be during the Civil War, whether it be during World War I, World War II, the American people have, have given up a degree of, of rights, a degree of privacy, until such time as the danger is passed. We did the exact same thing after 9-11. 9-11 attacks were shocking to this nation. It was a dangerous time, it was an unsure time for all of us. And, and, and for the younger people in this room, you grew up in this era of terrorism. Those of us who are a little bit older, uh, we can appreciate the difference between the, the older era and the post 9 11 era when it comes to um, issues of data privacy, data security, and giving, giving up certain rights. So after 9 11, we're shocked, we are scared, we are more than willing, just like after the attack on Pearl Harbor, we are more than willing to give up some of our rights uh, to include data privacy rights, to include. Um, Things like the Patriot Act, and things like the Patriot Act, which our representatives readily passed in 2001, in order to deal with the pending crisis of terrorism. Interesting enough, historically speaking, Americans are willing in times of crisis to give up rights. However, we're strange people because we set time limits on things. You know, World War II was four years, World War I was actually in irrigation two years, Civil War, four years. We are not willing, historically speaking, to give up a lot of rights for a protracted period of time. So there's sort of a timeline here. Right after 9-11, we are, once again, we are shocked and we are scared and we are willing, in order to address the crisis, to give up certain rights. We do that through federal, mainly federal legislation. However, now it's it's about a decade later, Americans, this pendulum which swung way right about protection of all of us versus individual rights is starting to swing backwards, back to where individual rights and how law enforcement and how national security agencies such as our intelligence services deal with issues of data privacy and individual rights. We can see them as in respect to domestic law enforcement, for example, of global positioning units. Prior to 2012, law enforcement could place a GPS tracking unit on your vehicle, absent probable cause, no warrant needed, no search warrant needed, due to the Fourth Amendment issue, was searching your location by tracking. The only thing we had to do was make sure we didn't attach the GPS unit 
while the vehicle was parked on your private property. So if it was out on the street, if it was out in a parking lot, and I, I was in law enforcement during the years, I actually authorized on a number of occasions the placement of a GPS unit on the suspect's car. So we were tracking them absent any warrants, right? Quite illegal. In New York State, by the way, that became a constitutional issue in 2009 with the Weaver decision. We could no longer do that. In fact, the New York Supreme Court followed in 2012. Once again, to illustrate this modern era of pendulum, the post 9 11 pendulum swinging back more towards individual rights <coughs> um, as we are more than a decade into this era of, of parents. And Americans are no longer willing to give up their individual rights, whether that be data privacy or Fourth Amendment rights, to, this extent, to the extent they were during the height of the crisis right after 9 11. Now, of course, um, with, the, with the Jones decision, the United States Supreme Court has restricted the attachment of GPS units to vehicles to track people absent probable cause. You need probable cause, of course, to get a search warrant. That really impairs law enforcement's ability to conduct um, investigations. And they, many agencies, large and small, were using GPS tracking prior to 2012, prior to 2009 in New York State. How about the most recent? Uh, cell phone search incidental to an arrest decision in the Riley case, a brand new decision just this early this summer, a significant um, blow in how law enforcement um, does obtain data. There's a little known case law uh, outside of law enforcement called Schimmel. Schimmel basically said that incident to arrest, which means when a police officer arrests you for something, incident to that arrest, they can search your body and any quote unquote containers on your body for issues of, of criminality, for uh, maybe you have evidence on it, maybe you have a weapon on, on you. For, uh, so, for officer safety, that was an exception to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the search warrant rule. Police officers, once again, can search you in any containers on your body to include wallets, uh, pockets, uh, any aspect of clothing or whatever. No warrant needed. To include cell phones, police officers did not need a warrant to search your cell phone for requisite data, uh, whether it was associated with the crime you were arrested for or not prior to this decision. Law enforcement agents across the country were getting significant data in terms of criminality from search incidental to arrest search of cell phones. While the important uh, Riley decision, and, and it's, it's interesting how the um, uh, Supreme Court worded it, so many words. Cell phones differ in both quantitative and qualitative in a qualitative sense from other objects that might be kept on an arrestee's person. Basically, what the Supreme Court is saying is you have a right to privacy even though you are arrested with regard to your cell phone. Because your cell phone is not just a container maintained on your body, um, such as a wallet. It has massive amounts of personal data not relevant to the arrest. Not relevant to officer safety. Obviously, in a cell phone, uh, there's not too much space to store a weapon that could be dangerous to a police officer. The courts have stepped back from the Schindler decision and have indicated that, um, once again, police officers are going to search the contents of the cell phone, they actually now need a search warrant. In order to get a search warrant, you have to probably cause criminality containing that, that um, cell phone. Most of the time, they're not going to happen. So, once again, the point being, this pendulum, this, this post 9 11 pendulum, is, is swinging back towards uh, more individual rights um, for the uh, individual as opposed to the safety uh, of everybody. So, so that is, that, that's actually on the quote unquote government side, that's on the side of uh, court decisions. But what about, what about um, private, private sector? We've seen this just recently, just in the past couple of weeks. Apple and Android are announcing new encrypted uh, uh, software on the phones, which uh, law enforcement cannot access. Uh, and uh, there's a counterpoint to that. Uh, the counterpoint is that law enforcement could access this prior to that, absolute work. And therefore, um, we are endangering the public by not being able to access. It's a direct result, by the way, of talking about the nexus of, of Snowden and domestic law enforcement. That's a direct result of the uh, I believe it's a direct result of the post, of the 
post-Snowden uh, revelations. Americans are, are really concerned about their data privacy. It's reflected in, in a lot of media coverage, reflected in a lot of congressional hearings, et cetera. So the companies on the private sector side are saying no to law enforcement. So law enforcement needs really to adapt to the public sector decisions, as this one, as this kind of one has gone back, as well as the private sector, where the government, where the private sector is now saying to the government, whether that be law enforcement or national security agencies, no access, absent, probably cause, absolutely. So in conclusion, I would watch this as it's changing all the time. It's very relevant for all of you sitting in this audience that are cybersecurity, economic crime, certain criminal justice. It affects your everyday work as you're going into these fields. Um, and it's really something very interesting and critical to watch as this pendulum swings back. Just as a conclusion, I'll say, as we, we face the newest crisis, that being ISIS and, and other terrorist groups, is the pendulum going to start swinging and get back the other way? Thank you. Thank you to our panel. Uh, I have uh, two staff members. If you guys could please come up here and grab the wireless mics for Q and A time, that uh, would be great. Just to create a little connected tissue, uh, if I may, between core presentations, it strikes me that a common thing, you know, among them is that. There's this sort of leakage that occurs in cyberspace. We may think that we're behaving in sort of responsible ways, we're protecting our information, we're protecting our data, and yet there are these tiny indications, behavioral indications, traces of ourselves that we leave online. And the trend now is to aggregate those to actually build a profile. So it's not just a question of having a username and a password on a particular website. Uh, and having that username and password be associated with all of your activity on the website. It's that we're leaving these cookie crumbs, if you will, along the way online. And analytics companies, and to an extent the government as well, are able to, to build a profile of us, to know us based upon our behavior, if not by uh, our individual names. So I have a bunch of questions for you guys, and uh, for you in the audience, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand. Uh, one of our staff can come over and bring the mic to you. Uh, I'll start with um, Chandler. So, with respect to data analytics companies, it seems like there's no legal obstacle to them building profiles of users based upon these sort of behavioral traces that they leave on the line. So, it, it seems that, yes, a law or a body of laws is needed to counteract this. But at the same time, we're talking about a very technical issue. So how would a legislative body go about getting that kind of technical expertise and folding that kind of technical expertise into the draft and public? It's a good question. And I think that um, what we're seeing now, both in federal and state legislation, uh, um, the, the legislature, both the state and federal government, is Legislators coming together and really taking a critical look at these issues, and they're um, getting buy-in from special interests and experts in these fields. So almost on a weekly basis, you see legislation introduced in the House and the Senate um, that governs this sort of data collection. I mentioned in my presentation that the FTC just uh, issued a very comprehensive report on these practices. Um, to answer your question, there's got to be some sort of balance, right? And that's one of the themes of this presentation today. Um, you know, after the case came out that I mentioned in my presentation about the privacy of bank records, um, Congress passed the Right to Financial Privacy Act. And what that basically says is that the federal government or whatever uh, the police agency is that needs um, to obtain that information has to get a warrant first. And so, you know, these are, these are problems that can be solved. They just have to be thought about uh, in a very, uh, in a very thoughtful way. <laughs> And, uh, and then have legislation constructed uh, around um, the interests of both you know, the state and, uh, and individuals with privacy rights. Um, just going down the line, I suppose. Uh, Leslie, my next question is for you. Um, you indicated in your presentation that we have this tendency to overshare information, including birthdays and vacation destinations and so forth. 
online than maybe we shouldn't be. Um, and so that raises this question that you brought up yourself. If bad people, bad actors out there want to use this information to do stuff to us, stuff that could harm us, that could deprive us of the money that we've earned, that could harm our reputation, that could damage our credit scores, and so forth. So could you flesh that out a little bit further? You know, could you describe how could somebody be extorted, say, or blackmailed, say, based upon the information that they put out about themselves online? Well, if you really want to stay safe on the internet, um, just don't go there. <laughs> Um, this and now my voice is done. No, I think that um, to not be extorted, um, I, I think that a lot of those kinds of cases um, seem to fall within kind of within the um, the defense industry. Um, Edward Snowden kind of put everyone in the defense industry a bad name because he was a contractor with a top secret clearance who had access to a whole lot of information. And he took it to, um, to, to Russia. So we, we have this problem. Um, not being extorted, being able to protect our data. I think one of, the, one of the things that we always fail to, to think about is when we're building software, when we're building things that we're going to be using from the very beginning, we should be thinking about security. There's been a there's been a, a trend um, in in Homeland Security for over ten years now to build security into the software and things that we're using, but but nobody's following it. Um, and Quite frankly, I, I think that we have a little bit of responsibility for this because we don't like those security barriers. We only like them when something happens and then we want to fix right away. So we're more than willing to give information away and, and share it without, um, without any hesitation at all until something happens. And then as soon as it does, we, we want the fast fix. So um, hopefully that answers answers a, a good part of that question. Yes, it does. I mean, it seems like it's more, as much about prevention as that. You know, yes. Um, so you're able, um, just a little bit of question. Uh, Sue, my next question is for you. Um, there's been a whole spat of data breaches in the retail sector specifically. Um, in my opening remarks, I cited Home Depot, I cited Dairy Queen, uh, Target and even Marcus have also been very famous targets. Um, what's your sense of how quickly retailers will embrace credit card chip technology? And what do you see as the obstacles to implementing credit card chip technology, specifically in the retail sector? Well, actually, um, that is coming sooner rather than later. Um, the chip card uh, dilemma for the United States because typically uh, for years, and I'm talking 10 years ago, Europe and many other uh, places in the world had chip card. The U.S. is one of the last. And there's a, a variety of different reasons for that, uh, for instance, upgrading equipment and things like that. But uh, MasterCard and Visa, all the card schemes have now said that by 2015, the U.S. must have chip. Um, currently, Canada has gone to chip. Mexico has gone to chip. Um, I guess where all the frauds going to go, so we go to chip, right? And we're already seeing that migration, and it's a very international fraud that's happening. We've had cases where people are actually flying over from the UK um, to empty our ATMs because they can use the cards here in the US with just the mag strike and the pin. You can't use these cards at ATMs in most of Europe, Asia, Latin America, because of the chip. So we have finally, because this has been on the radar for 10 years at least, the US is going to chip. Um, 2015, and then ATMs must be compliant as well. And so some of you, I think even in our classes, we've talked about some of you are already getting your cards that have the chip in it. And the chip has the encryption. 
The max strike will still uh, be around for a little while, but most, if you go into most large retailers now, you will see that their terminals are chip capable. Um, it's always a matter of cost. Uh, in many cases, the fraud losses uh, were not significant enough when balanced against how much it would cost to upgrade the infrastructure. So that has changed. So in the next couple of years, even though better late than never, um, we will be a chip car country. Very good. That's encouraging, certainly. Uh, that we're going to harder to crack technology. Hello. Um, I have a quick question while we we're talking about money. Um, I know soon, uh, within the next uh, decade or so, money is looking to be completely all online. You know, um, cyber coins or bitcoins. Um, I was just wondering what anybody's opinion on is on that and how do you think it will be affecting our society and economy? Um, I'm going to let Well, Bitcoin, actually there's stocks because Bitcoin doesn't work too much anymore. So I'm going to refer to this as alternative payments. All right. Those that are, that go under the banking system, so to speak. Will there always be the underground for alternative payments? Absolutely, because the banking system has become so sophisticated in detecting many things like terrorist financing, uh, any type of money laundering, um, following the bad guys, that just like everything else is whack-a-mole, that term, right? So we've gone very, very well sophisticated in our technology to detect money movements in the banking systems, and this is globally. So we're, we are pushing folks underground. Now, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which monitors all the treasury and the money laundering and banks, has also come out and said banks must now look at alternative payments. Because at the end of the day, you have to get money, right? So sooner or later, those alternative payments are transferred into some dollars as well. But there is that underground economy, very difficult. It's global. Some countries, have um, made it illegal, but those are countries like China, right? And why does China want to do something like that? Well, that's because they can't, they can't follow the money. So I think you'll see efforts to regulate, but at the end of the day, it's going to be extremely difficult. I have a question now for Ray. Uh, Ray, you used this great image in your remarks um, of pendulum, and after something bad happens, United States, that pendulum tends to swing away from the idea of personal rights and liberties, and so we're willing to accept certain limitations on this thing for better security. And then as more time passes, the pendulum tends to swing back the other way. So I was curious, do you think it will necessarily take uh, another physical event that involves physical destruction like 9-11 to make that pendulum swing? Or do you see potential for a cyber event to cause a similar reaction in moving the pendulum toward security and away from individual rights and liberties and so on? Well, we all know, we all realize now, um, abstractly at least, what a cyber attack can, can do to us, even though it's not quote unquote physical attack. It can be devastating to the economy. So, the answer to half of that question is I see a, a cyber attack which damages our critical infrastructure uh, to, an ex to an extent that really harms our economy and shocks our conscience, that it will, that pendulum will swing that. I think that's a natural uh, inclination of, of, of the human species actually is to do that, and the politicians is, is to do that. And how long that lasts, I, I don't know. But this isn't anything new, as I indicated, this pendulum is swinging back, back and forth as we face um, Crisis. We are facing a new unique crisis, asymmetrical warfare, which terrorists it is, um, cyber attacks that can really impair our critical infrastructure. So, yeah, I, I do think that that pendulum can certainly swing. It can certainly swing very quickly if we have a major cyber attack as opposed to a, uh, a physical attack. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, a question here that uh, from our YouTube audience. This is from Scott. Uh, a student here, by the way. Scott writes, in my previous residency at Major College, some law enforcement personnel in the cohort were hoped that Edward Snowden should be shot on sight 
without any trial as a traitor to the United States. Others felt that he should receive the trial as he knew that the classified information he revealed involved major compromises to U.S. intelligence gathering. So, is there a consensus of thought among Utica's faculty about Edward Snowden? This is definitely a hornet's nest of a question. Uh, so I'm willing to throw myself into this one if there are no takers, but I open the floor to you guys. I'll, I'll start. Uh, coincidentally, this morning I was looking at that very data and preparing uh, my remarks. I was looking at some polling data regarding what the American, and different, you know, to get a perspective, what the American people feel about Edward Snowden and the consequences Edward Snowden should, should, should face, should he ever face consequences for his actions. Interestingly enough, it's sort of an anomaly here. Um, Edward Snowden opened up a lot of concerns for the, for, for the American public, the average American, data privacy, what the government is doing behind our back. Uh, be careful, the government is watching you both domestically and in international. Shocking, shocking us into action, congressional hearings, uh, some of the information I put up about working in America, uh, restricting access to uh, by the government to their data, which they had been doing in the past. But yet, interestingly enough, uh, while Americans have taken seriously those concerns raised by Edward Snowden, the vast majority, and almost every poll I looked at, indicated that Edward Snowden should say he is not a hero, it's the average American, not just law enforcement, and that he should face the appropriate charges. Um, I believe there is a, a pending indictment under the Espionage Act for Edward Snowden, um, that he should be facing charges. So once again, looking at that, those polls, the American people are not looking at Edward Snowden as a hero, and they are um, looking at him as a, as a criminal, uh, someone who is engaged in treason. And if they ever, we can ever prove a nexus that Edward Snowden's leak of information resulted in a terrorist attack or resulted in deaths in our military or fighting overseas, then I think that, that pendulum will once again swing even even against Edward Snowden even more. Um, but the American people do not, it's not me saying this, you can Google this yourself, the American people are not looking at Edward Snowden, the majority of them, the uh, vast majority of them, as a, as a hero. It's here based on all of that, just from just looking at this morning. Great. I, my own view on this, um, paraphrasing the French writer Voltaire, who said, uh, if God didn't exist, man would have created him anyway. I maintain that if Edward Snowden did not exist, uh, man would have created him anyway. In other words, it did not necessarily take the volume of Edward Snowden's disclosures to spark this debate, uh, but now that it is here, it is very much worth having, and that indeed was our purpose here today. I'd like to thank the panel for participating, and thank you for attending. Thank you.